<laughs> Welcome everybody. My name is Corinne. Um, I'm so happy to have you all here for this virtual synthetic biology event. Um, myself and Alexa, uh, Alexa, if you will raise your hand really quickly. Um, we've been putting this together for a couple months now, so it's really awesome that we're here. And yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Alexa, you can you can start with the presentation. So we're Young Women in Bio. Um, we give girls the inspiration and support they need to become tomorrow's leaders in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we provide education and hands-on experience in STEM as well as other scientific fields. So right now, the launch of YWeb Online comes at a time when there's a real need to provide young girls who cannot otherwise attend our events and programs with access to online programming in STEM. This will help with our goal to ignite curiosity and to inspire young women to see a future for themselves in STEM. We believe that by making these online resources available to a broader audience of girls, we can encourage more young women to find a lifelong passion and career in STEM. So YWIB is a part of Women in Bio with chapters nationwide and in Canada. It's a nonprofit volunteer organization that promotes diversity and inclusion for women in life sciences and beyond. Awesome, I'm um, doing go to the next slide. So part of the reason why, or the reason why Alexa and I are here is because due to a new initiative started by Young Women in Bio called the Ambassador Program. Um, and what this program is, is it's an opportunity for high school students. Um, it's you apply and you're selected to be a part of this program, uh, but you are able to lead outreach events for, to include um, for, uh, inclusivity and diversity in STEM events such as this one that you're coming to today. Um, but also there's a lot of other projects that our ambassadors have been doing. Uh, there's one in each chapter. And so some are planning events in their chapter, others are doing uh, more national things. Social media is a big part of it. Um, but this is also, if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, uh, there will be a new ambassador chosen uh, each year. So we encourage you all to apply if you think that's something uh, that you'd enjoy doing. Um, I'm also open to answering any questions. Uh, you can go follow us on Instagram at YWIB Ambassadors or YWIB RTP. You can DM us and we'll be happy to uh, help you guys out. It's, it's been a really wonderful time so far. Uh, so I'd highly recommend it to anyone. Um, just a quick introduction about myself. Like I said before, my name is Corinne. I am a senior. I am, uh, my post high school graduation plans are probably a major in biochemistry uh, and possibly going on to like bioengineering or chemical engineering. Um, but I've been a part of Young Women of Bio since my freshman year uh, at a starting uh, at a club at my high school. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my history. Alexa, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I'm Alexa Tasher. Um, I'm a senior too. I go to school in Raleigh. I've been involved in YWIB for about three years. Um, and if you have any questions about the ambassador program, you can feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Um, so the way that today's schedule will work is that first we will have our lovely guest speaker, Dr. Natalie Caldell. Um, and so she will go first and then afterwards we will proceed with a biodesign activity and then a bioethics discussion. Uh, so a quick introduction to Dr. Cordell, sorry, Caldell. Uh, she is a MIT senior lecturer uh, in biological engineering and she is also the founder and executive of BioBuilder, which is a nonprofit organization that provides uh, a wide variety of different programming to help um, get students involved in synthetic biology. And Alexa and I are actually part of one right now called the Project Development Studio, uh, where you kind of like what we're gonna do today, where you de develop your own biodesign, uh, but you get to do a lot more research and go in depth in terms of like the different biological parts uh, that go together. Um, our project right now is using yeast to produce spider silk. So we're pretty excited. Our presentation's in a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, enough about that. 
Dr. Koldell. We're so happy to have you. Please take it away. Thank you all. I could not be happier uh, to be here and sharing this Saturday with you all. Um, Corinne and Alexa, you are doing such an amazing job. I'm thrilled to have you as part of the BioBuilder community. Super excited to see your project in a few weeks and very, very grateful for all the work that you have put into putting this terrific program together for everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be able to kick it off with a short presentation about BioBuilder and about biodesign to get the uh, activities started. So let me begin by sharing my screen. All right. Um, can someone give me a thumbs up that they can see my screen now? Not yet. All right, thumbs down. All right, <laughs> let me try again. Uh, let me share that. How's that? Not yet. Oh, thumbs up. Woo, I don't know what I did different, but there we go. Okay, so um, uh, so we've heard enough about me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the things I do uh, in the question and answer period, uh, sort of at the end of this presentation. But let's kick off by talking a little bit about the organization I run, which is called BioBuilder. Our tagline is bringing tomorrow's science into today's classrooms. And when I've given talks about this in the past, I've had both teachers and students say, something to me that sounds a lot like, well, gee, it would be awesome to even bring today's science into today's classrooms. And um, I, I don't quite know how to answer that because I, I think science is so very interesting. And with biology in particular, there are so many incredible developments that um, change the way we think about how living systems work uh, that it's such a great opportunity to be forward looking when we think about teaching biology. And so BioBuilder was really started with the hope that we could bring authentic research questions and current science and engineering into classrooms everywhere. Um, our curriculum is in a field called synthetic biology that I'll tell you a little bit about during the next set of slides, but we really have two audiences for our work. We are direct engaged with students uh, as they try to integrate biology and engineering uh, in systems like what you what Corinne mentioned, the idea that maybe you could re-engineer and recode a yeast cell, those standard organisms that use to bake bread and brew beer, to reprogram that with some novel DNA so that now those yeast have been taught how to make something impressive like spider silk. Not that beer and bread aren't impressive. I'm a big fan of carbohydrates. So, <laughs> but to be able to think about yeast doing something that spiders do is really pretty astonishing. And so BioBuilder is directed towards students so that those who are interested in developing a project idea that uh, they've come up with, we, we mentor and forward those ideas. We also directly train teachers because uh, teachers are wonderful ambassadors for our program and really amplify what we do. So every year we train uh, at least 100 teachers uh, through our, on our direct uh, workshops and then they bring this content into the classrooms and into their after school clubs in any way that they um, feel works for them. And so we're, we're excited to work with both audiences. Um, some of the resources that are part of BioBuilder include an open access textbook, which was published by O'Reilly, uh, and there are chapters freely downloadable on the website. If any of the work that you hear today is enticing to you and you'd like to read more, you can navigate over to biobuilder.org and download the chapters to take a peek at those. Um, our curriculum has a number of hands-on activities, which in this time of COVID, we have been uh, sadly separated from. We are not doing a lot of hands-on work uh, this year, but the kinds of uh, experiments that students who work with BioBuilder can do uh, include the re-engineering of normally stinky smelling bacteria so that they smell sweet like bananas. We have yeast that um, make a vitamin, vitamin A, a precursor to a vitamin, so that those could be perhaps baked into a bread and uh, remediate vitamin A deficiency uh, in places that don't have uh, yellow vegetables. We have bacteria that turn different colors like purple and green. Uh, and then we also have uh, 
a system to make a given output of an enzyme, not necessarily the most that the cell could do, but actually to try to uh, dial in a, a desired amount of an output from a system. So all of these are hands-on labs that can be engaged with through BioBuilder. And again, all the content is on our website for students and teachers. Um, the reason, the, the enabling factor in synthetic biology is the fact that we can program cells or we are working towards the ability to program cells the same way we might program a computer. So with computer language in ones and zeros, uh, the language for cells is written in Gs and As and Ts and Cs, the code of DNA. And we understand certainly not everything about that code, but we understand a lot about it. We know that that code can copy itself in a process called replication, and that that code can be read into the functional portions of the code uh, through a process called transcription and then translation, where the DNA is transcribed into an RNA copy and the RNA copy is translated into a protein and the proteins carry out many of the functions that the cell needs to carry out. So given that this is a coding language that we can read and now some of the technology exists for us to also write it, if you can read and write a code and put it into an operating system, which is a cell, Effectively, that is a language, a programming language, not that different than the programming languages that you might imagine running uh, computer technologies. And so maybe it's not too surprising that some of the people who are most interested and some of the uh, investors in this field were uh, themselves the tech founders. Um, you probably recognize uh, probably many of these people and certainly probably all of these uh, technologies that these tech founders uh, have developed and now these guys are very interested in synthetic biology. So it's a great field, it's an emerging field, and it's a field that requires a lot of creativity and talent and is motivated by the desire to do something with biology, something to um, make the world a better place and to do that through living cells and living systems. So how do we do that? Um, the idea is that we are going to deploy a design, build, and test cycle, which is what engineers use as they engineer new systems. But in this case, the design, build, and test is going to be directed towards the engineering of a living system, right? And the question now is like, it's a cycle. Where should we start? Right? So this is a cycle. Um, we'd like to use it, but what is the smartest and, and most sensible place to start? Well, I guess I'm going to tell you that it uh, probably doesn't much matter where you start, but one possibility is that you could start with the building portion of this cycle. It's a trial and error effort, um, and it's akin to this game called Mousetrap, which I don't know that I've played recently, so probably not, but it's a Rube Goldberg machine where you put the pieces together and the goal is to get, I think, a ball from a high position down into a bucket at the bottom and you uh, set things up and you make, you make it run and then you see where the ball goes and then you readjust. So it's a guess and check method, a, a trial and error method for building a novel system. Um, and you might think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense for doing that with biology. Are we really going to build and test and then edit um, for, for living systems. And uh, I would say that actually this is exactly what nature does, right? We have cells in, that exist in our living world. The DNA code mutates over time with uh, replication cycles. There are variations in the code that arise naturally or under particular conditions. Um, some of those changes are positive changes that help the cell thrive and some inhibit the cells thriving. And so the ones that are unfavored leave the population and the ones that are favored continue through the population. And so this is effectively a guess and check method that nature uses to evolve living systems. But it's slow and it's pretty unpredictable. And so although it can be used to design uh, novel living systems that we are um, engineering, uh, it may not be the best place to start or it's one place to start, but maybe not the most efficient place to start. Um, so then um, maybe, a different place to start would be with the testing portion, right? That what does it mean to start with data? 
and think about engineering a cell based on existing data. And that's actually a process called reverse engineering, where you start with a system that already works and you try to figure out, well, how does that work? What, it, what about it is making it so special? And how can I take those portions that make it special and deploy it towards the engineering direction that I'm trying to reach. Um, and the example that I've um, come to like recently about this reverse engineering idea comes from F1 racing, uh, which is not a sport I had followed until uh, somewhat recently, but there's a, a terrific um, Netflix special about the F1 racers and it kind of got me interested in it. So um, in this case, the uh, F1 racing conditions, the, the way the, the race is set up is that the cars can uh, use parts from other cars, but they can't, um, uh, they can't get the specifications from those parts. They have to just observe those parts and then put those parts into their new cars. And so the best car, the one that continues to win year after year is the Mercedes and a different team, a team called Racing Point, decided that they really liked that Mercedes car, which kept winning. And so um, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle about the fact that um, the Racing Point team, look, the, the car looked so very much like their Mercedes car from the, the winning team the year before. Um, and when they were asked about it, um, the uh, design team behind the Racing Point car uh, described their design process uh, in this way, and you'll see that it is exactly the description of reverse engineering. So let me play this short clip from that design team. F1's rules are clear on the fundamental parts of a car that teams have to produce themselves. However, as long as they are carrying out their own work, there's nothing to stop a team trying to copy the look of another team's parts. The key here is that these parts cannot be made by the team that they are trying to copy. And Racing Point would not be allowed to receive design data from Mercedes from its 2019. In principle, Otmar Zafnauer has described Racing Point's philosophy as copying another team within the rules, saying that it did the same with Red Bull in the past. Racing Point works from pictures of another car, tries to understand it, and then sets its in house design team to work on developing its own version. So isn't that great? What a perfect example of reverse engineering. It is copying within the rules, taking what you can understand from another system and deploying it in your own system. And so um, that is a, a sort of a poster child for what reverse engineering looks like when you're trying to engineer a car. In terms of how you might reverse engineer a living system, I have a couple of examples. One is this one. It came out of a research lab uh, that is run by Craig Venter, one of the sequencers of the human genome. Uh, and they, uh, his lab published the design and synthesis of a minimal bacterial genome. What they wanted to find was the simplest bit of DNA that could be used to ex, uh, drive the life, the division and the replication of a, of a simple bacterial cell. So they started with the complete genome, which was a million bases. And they started to just cut it down bit by bit, throw out certain sections, and they reduced it to about half a million base pairs. And that was enough to generate a new living system that is based on the old living system, but now it has a simpler, uh, more uh, streamlined genome than the original living system does. So that's a reverse engineering of a novel system based on an existing system. There are some other examples that I wanted to touch on uh, just before we go to the very last possibility for engineering living systems. One of them uh, is the notion that we might uh, through the um, re-engineering of living systems, uh, bring back the woolly mammoth. So there are some scientists, one here in Boston, uh, the lab of George Church uh, over at Harvard Medical School in the Vise, um, that is interested in extracting DNA from the permafrost where they find these woolly mammoth carcasses and piecing back that piecing that DNA back together uh, in order to bring uh, perhaps a woolly mammoth back to life through the fostering of uh, uh, the incubation of that uh, new woolly mammoth in an elephant of some sort. 
lots of ethical issues around that, lots of questions around it. Um, there is a book about it if this is um, sort of interesting to you and you wanted to just uh, think about some of the reasons why somebody might want to and might not want to bring back the woolly mammoth. Uh, it's a terrific book by Ben Mesrick. The other uh, reverse engineering of life comes from um, this group, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a synthetic biology company, again, here in Boston. Um, in this magazine that they put out called Grow, there is an article called Ghost Scent, if you can see that, um, and a little scratch and sniff card that they included in this magazine, which allows you to smell an extinct flower. They went to a seed bank and extracted the DNA from a seed of a plant that no longer exists on the planet. And they uh, put some of the genes from that extracted DNA into a new system um, and allowed that system to express the scent of the plant that is now extinct on the planet. So this initial idea of, of resurrecting uh, living organisms based on the existing DNA that, that uh, remains uh, is something that can happen, at least with this scent. Uh, the woolly mammoth is still a long ways off, but um, it's an interesting um, potential application uh, in terms of biodiversity and biodiversity perhaps preservation, um, but it is also fraught. And so I'm really thrilled and delighted that, that as part of this afternoon, Corinne and Alexa have included some bioethics discussions because these are at the heart of synthetic biology, whether just because we can do something, whether it makes sense that we should do it. All right, All right so um, I'll sort of yeah, give away the punchline here and tell you that the the approach that we take with, synth with synthetic biology and biobuilder is to try to forward engineer life, to start with the design piece of the project that you have in mind and then go through the build and test cycle. So by starting with the design, this is a forward engineering approach to living systems. And as an example um, for getting us started and to lead us into the activities for uh, later, the design activities that Corinne and Alexa will lead, um, here's an example. If, for example, uh, you wanted to build a cell that could detect arsenic and then turn red when levels of arsenic became unsafe. So perhaps there is a well uh, in a town that occasionally gets contaminated and you wouldn't want to drink the water because arsenic is so very poisonous. But if you could sample the water and drip it onto maybe a, a cell or a a sheet of cells, and those cells turned red if that arsenic level was too high, um, then you would know not to drink the water with that level of contamination. So the forward engineering of life, if it were really possible, we would come up with that idea for the system. We would sit at our computers and type out the G's, A's, T's, and C's, that programming language, to be able to then send to a company or send to our DNA printer uh, to, be a, to then type out in in material, the pattern, the G's, A's, T's, and C's, and take that material, that DNA, input and input it into a cell and allow that cell to do what you plan for it to do. So in that uh, analogy with computer science, the notion that you can program a cell, uh, in this case, you have to fabricate the DNA and instill it into the operating system of the cell. But that is the goal. That is the thought that we might be able to do this through the field of synthetic biology. Um, and so the, the test case that we're thinking about is that the input of the cell is going to be arsenic. When this novel cell detects arsenic, it will um, process that information. And then the output of that cell is going to be a color. And how exactly we do that inside the cell, we are going to pretend we don't have to know that just yet. All right, that's called um, abstraction or um, masking some of the details while we continue at this level of design. If we get too bogged down in the details too fast, right? How are we gonna detect arsenic? How much arsenic are we gonna be able to detect? How quickly can the color be made? All of these are incredibly important questions, but in terms of the design of our system, it will get in the way if we start to get into that nitty gritty too fast. So it is a 
disciplined way of thinking to engineer this system at that higher level of abstraction, thinking about the cell as an input and an output machine, right? Not how we're gonna get that cell to do it, but really just understanding what is the cell detecting and what do we want that cell to do when it's detected its signal. So arsenic is the example that's here and the color that we're gonna generate is a red color. Hopefully that's reasonably clear. Um, as a warm up to the um, biodesign activities that you'll do in a little bit, um, let me give you an alternative to this test case and maybe ask if you wouldn't mind typing some ideas into the chat box. Um, this test case, it's a modification of this system, but the idea is that we want the cell not to detect just arsenic, but to actually detect two things, arsenic and something else. And what that something else is, is completely in your control, it is completely up to you. So think about what kind of a system you might find interesting to have this cell detecting arsenic and something else. And then you don't only get to decide on that second input, but you also get to decide on the output. I, in the first system that I gave you, identified a color as an output, a red color, but maybe you want the cell to do something else. When it detects both of those signals, what do you want that output to be? What do you want the cell to do? So if you want to just think about it for a minute um, and then type some ideas either um, privately to me in the chat box or to everyone, um, I will tell you there are no wrong ideas here. So you can go ahead and um, come up with some thoughts, type them into the chat box, um, and we'll, we'll think about what those systems might look like and how they might work. Um, if you can um, go ahead and try that. I'll give you just uh, a minute here to get uh, your thoughts together and typed into the chat box and then we'll explore the ideas. And Corinne or Alexa, if you wanna put some ideas into, I don't wanna inhibit your uh, ideas. Great, wonderful ideas. Wow, Yasneen, what a great idea. Boy, these are fun. What's always amazing to me is when I ask this question, we get lots of different answers, right? There's no single design that everybody wants to put together. Um, wow, great. So um, we have a, a couple of um, very smart ideas about detecting not only arsenic, but other heavy metals or perhaps poisonous metals or, or soil-based metals or water-based metals. So we have mercury and copper and uh, lead, all things that would be really important to know if they're present um, and that the outputs of those systems when you detect those two metals um, one is uh, turning purple, which is a combination of red and blue. That's a super neat idea because you could also imagine designing this system so that if it's arsenic, it's red, if it's copper, it's blue, and if it's both, it's purple, right? So you could come up with a logic table that would change the, the range of colors that you might get from this system. So that would be sort of a, a redesign of your system on top of this existing system. That's pretty cool. We also have some ideas about detecting not metals, but actually um, a gas like carbon dioxide. And that's such a, a interesting idea, right? We have um, carbon dioxide contributing to our, our climate issues. And so if we had a, a rapid and sensitive way to detect carbon dioxide output, it would be very, very interesting. And the output of the system here is to enlarge, which I think is so cool. You can imagine the cell like blowing up, like inflating like a balloon. And so maybe it would be visible or detectable or something like that. Um, we have uh, also another output um, from Corinne that would be a change in smell, right? I mentioned at the beginning that we've redesigned ba stinky bacteria so they smell like bananas. So maybe when the two inputs to this system are, are both detected, you get this very strong pungent banana scent or something like that. Um, I think these are such 
smart and interesting answers. Um, terrific for all of you for coming up with them. And um, isn't it amazing that with this abstraction up at this very high level, you don't have to know how you're going to implement this. The design is really about figuring out what are we detecting and what is the output? And once you have settled on those, identified what is the intention of your system, then you can start to dig into what exactly is in that black box. How are we going to implement the arsenic sensing or the color generating? And that's another uh, way to approach this. Um, one, one last input here uh, is to, um, to make the cells glow, right? So, so we've had wonderful ideas about making the cells change colors, making the cells enlarge, making the cells smell different, and making the cells glow like this um, fantastic uh, jellyfish, right, that can glow these fluorescent uh, colors or bioluminescence, all sorts of cool things. So the, the takeaway I hope from all this is that nature has incredible capabilities, right? It can do so many amazing things. And that as we understand uh, the way cells are working and the DNA that is responsible for making those functions happen, we now have the opportunity to redesign, um, to, to rewrite nature's code um, and think about deploying it in robust and safe and meaningful ways that help us address some of the greatest challenges that our planet is facing. Um, and so um, with that as the sort of broad introduction to synthetic biology and a little bit of practice for uh, biodesign and a small introduction to the bioethics of it all, um, I wanna just um, end my comments, uh, my prepared comments and say um, we have teams of high school students all over the country and all over the world who are coming up with wonderful ideas for the biodesign uh, projects that they're working on. In normal years, we run something called the BioBuilder Club, which runs from October to March. And we pair teams of students up with bioengineering mentors to help them think about how to design, build, and test their living systems. And in March, we come together for a large uh, celebration of all the work that the teams have done. And we celebrate all levels of uh, accomplishment, whether it is the um, thorough design of a system, the ability to test some portions of those systems. Um, it's all welcomed and it's all um, very fun and very interesting. Um, this year, because of the remote nature of most people's work, we have been running what's called an idea accelerator, which is a three week introduction to biodesign. That's an online program. And students come up with some interesting ideas from that. And those student teams that are interested in advancing those projects join what uh, Corinne mentioned as the project development studio, which is our version of the BioBuilder Club uh, this time fully online. Um, so those are some of the things that are happening within BioBuilder to support this kind of work for high school students and their teachers. Um, I am happy to um, sort of uh, complete the, the conversation that I was I had prepared and open it up to any questions that you might have about either the things that I have said um, or any of the other things that have perhaps led me to uh, this Saturday afternoon with you. How did I land uh, as a, a executive director of a nonprofit, which I can tell you I never your age imagined I'd ever be doing. <laughs> so um, lots of twists and turns. Um, and if you have questions, uh, as Corinne mentions, you can put those questions uh, into the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, yes, is there an application-based program and do applications open for future sessions? So um, our goal in BioBuilder is to give everyone an opportunity to learn about engineering of biology. So um, we currently have um, programming that runs that you simply need to express interest in and uh, join. And we are glad to have you um, and your teachers uh, and your classmates. Um, we have programming that can be as short as um, uh, half an hour. We run sometimes lunch and learn seminars, um, and sometimes uh, we run 
you know, biodesign lectures, bioengineering for a changing world is a four part lecture series that we run. Um, the materials are online um, and we're eager to have you participate any way uh, that works for you. Um, and I hope we'll see you soon. Um, Trisha asks, um, has the pandemic accelerated my online engagement? Yes, I will confess to everyone on this line that if you had asked me uh, a year and a week ago, if BioBuilder could be done online, I would have rolled my eyes and said, I'm not really very sure. But the experience that I have had in this past year with everybody working from home, uh, it has catalyzed a lot of changes within our organization. And I am now very much a believer that the online uh, on-ramps to our work uh, are valuable, that we will continue to offer them even after people go back into in-person learning. I see them as on-ramps. I see them as ways that people uh, uncoupled from geography, right? So like I'm here in Massachusetts, I have a teaching lab in Cambridge for the folks that are within driving distance, they can come and they can actually do the experiments with me in my teaching lab. Uh, but if you aren't in driving distance to Cambridge, now we can interact in ways that are meaningful uh, and uh, that you can now do the experiments in your labs uh, with your classmates uh, and in other ways. So I think uh, the online portions, the online uh, introduction to BioBuilder is definitely here to stay. Um, and then uh, a great question from Yasmin is how hard is this, right? So we all came up with a handful of very cool ideas for the arsenic detector plus, right? The arsenic detector 2.0. Um, and uh, if you step back for just a minute and you know think about it, how, how hard is it? Um, right now, biology is still very tricky to engineer. Um, we know a lot about biology. We can understand a lot of the functions and a lot of the functions do port from one system to the other. So for example, the jellyfish is a, the green fluorescence from a jellyfish is a terrific uh, case to show that you can take the DNA sequence that leads to that fluorescence in jellyfish and move that DNA sequence into other organisms and they will glow that same kind of jellyfish green, that fluorescence. So uh, it is possible to take parts, DNA parts, and make them something that uh, can be moved from system to system. Um, but more often than not, there is a lot of failure as people try to design living systems, um, things that don't interact well when you put them into a system, things that have emergent properties, right? You put two things in and they don't behave the way you expected them to, they do something else. Um, things that influence one another. So for example, you know, like when you're driving a car, if you're turning the wheel, you're not also changing the volume on the radio, right? So in, when you're bu building living systems, sometimes, unfortunately, you put two things in and then they interact with each other so that when one changes, the other also changes and that's not what you meant to do. So the ability to insulate the parts from one another, the ability to predict the outcomes of the systems, um, the ability to know um, how to actually assemble these systems. Uh, it's sort of the, the uh, syntax, right? In, in a computer coding language, you have syntax, right? We're learning all of those things in synthetic biology, which to me makes it an amazing learning and teaching opportunity, right? It, it is a disservice to science and engineering when we teach science and engineering as if everything is already known, as if by memorizing Campbell or whichever textbook you're using right now is, is the definition of being a good scientist. I think it is important to know stuff, but even more, it's important to be asking good questions, to know where the limits of understanding are and to see yourself as having a place in that future where you can discover really interesting things and contribute to the body of knowledge. And so um, to me, that's really the, the piece of BioBuilder that I get most excited about is the idea that we're giving everybody agency with biology. Everybody can design these novel systems and learn how to try to build them and, and what they learn will contribute to the greater good and to the greater understanding. Um, Oh boy, we have some really good questions. <laughs> I and mean, I'll try to be brief so that we don't take up too much of the time that you've dedicated to the biodesign piece. Um, I, um, all right, uh, one question is about computer coding and bioengineering. Um, uh, I am 
not a computer scientist. My son is a computer scientist. He's very smart and he teaches me a lot. Um, and I consistently um, use computer science as an analogy because I'm, I'm learning it and I see the parallels between that and the coding of, of living systems. Um, there is a lot of computation that can assist in the design of living systems. There are entire companies that are using computers to uh, predict how to assemble DNA in a way that will build cells to do what we want them to do. So um, if you find this interesting, but sort of find computer science more interesting, I would suggest that there are ways of doing both and that you don't have to choose um, and that they will complement one another um, in many, many positive ways. Um, someone asked if I spend a lot of time working um, with the environment directly. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure if you mean um, building systems that get deployed into the environment or working out in the community directly. Um, we do have a teaching lab and I do engage with our community as much as possible. We are expanding the number of teaching labs and the number of teachers that we teach. Um, we, we are part of a larger ecosystem and our um, uh, and I think that's really the only way to achieve the kinds of goals that we have, which is to give everyone the opportunity to learn this if, um, uh, if they are in a science class. So I, I think that um, being part of a larger environment, a larger ecosystem uh, is really um, both satisfying and, and essential for the work that we do. If you mean, do I put um, materials out into the environment? Um, there, there are a lot of regulations about engineered systems and the deploying of engineered systems in the environment. The one that I think is most um, uh, readily uh, sort of moved into more familiar environments like your kitchen would be our yeast-based lab in which yeast are made to um, uh, make this precursor to vitamin A. And with that yeast, it is possible to bake a bread and brew a beer and have them <laughs> perhaps make a vitamin with them. I would not encourage you to eat them because those yeast did come from my lab, but <laughs> it is possible to see these out into the world. And Synthetic Biology does have a number of companies that are bringing their products out into the world now. If I had had the opportunity to talk to you even two or three years ago, I could have only named a handful of companies that were actually bringing the synthetic products that they had made through Synthetic Biology into the world. But now there are many, many, many companies that are actually doing this work. It's plant-based foods, it's yeast, um, it's microbes, it's algae that are making materials for snowboards. Um, there's just a lot of bio-based products that are being made now, bio-made products. Okay, and then maybe the very last question um, that I'll take here is from, from Tricia, thank you for asking it. It's um, a little bit about my career path. Um, I got very excited to be a scientist when I was in high school, and it was because I had the chance to do some research in a real research laboratory. Uh, at the National Institutes of Health. I worked in Marshall Nirenberg's lab. He had won the Nobel Prize for identifying the first triplet codon for, um, for uracil. Um, and uh, his lab was working on very fundamental questions in E. coli. In fact, it was, you know, how do you bring glucose into the cell? I loved it. I could not believe that this was like, that, that this was science, right? Like I, like I said, I liked science in high school. I just didn't understand that science was a lot about figuring stuff out. Um, and once I saw that, I realized I wanted to do science. Um, I went to Cornell for uh, my undergraduate experience and I studied chemistry there. I was not great at chemistry. I didn't love chemistry. I had been told that chemistry is a good background for biology and uh, I didn't question. I just blindly followed it and, I, and so I, I studied chemistry. I agree that I think it's a very good background for biology. Uh, one of the things that it has done for me is um, made me unafraid to look at molecules, right? I look at the structures of molecules and, and they don't scare me anymore. So um, I think that's a, a good outcome. I also like math and there's a lot of math in chemistry. 
Um, and then I actually took a year off before starting graduate school in Boston. My year off was spent here in Boston. Uh, I joined a dance company. I'm a dancer and uh, was fortunate to join a dance company that year that I took between college and graduate school. Um, I still dance, um, although up in my attic now with online classes as opposed to in the studio, but uh, hoping to get back into the studio once we can. Um, and then I started graduate school and did my graduate work and postdoctoral work at Harvard Medical School, studying um, basic gene transcriptions. How do you turn genes on and off, uh, first in E. coli and then in yeast? Uh, and when I was in my postdoc, I had my daughter, um, who is now 24 years old, um, and at that point realized that I didn't want to run my own lab anymore uh, and was looking around for anything else that I could do uh, and landed a wonderful teaching job at Wellesley College uh, just down the street here uh, in Massachusetts and found that as much as I love laboratory work, even more I love teaching. And so uh, I have spent the rest of my career doing teaching and curriculum development. Um, I was six years at Wellesley College and then moved to MIT when they were starting the biological engineering major there. Um, uh, I didn't know anything about engineering. I, I'm almost embarrassed about the silly things that I would say about engineers and engineering. Um, but I have since found that engineering is an incredibly satisfying way to put the understanding you get from science into the world in useful ways. And there is just a lot of joy and satisfaction in doing that well. Um, and so um, that's where I've been. Um, I've been at MIT for uh, 18 years at this point, something like that, and started my nonprofit 10 years ago because I think that the teaching and learning we were doing at MIT, we just wanted to get out into the world. And so more teachers, more students having a chance to do the work that we were doing at MIT. And that is why I'm here with you today. I am always so happy to be able to talk to students and um, have a chance to um, maybe share something that you hadn't thought about before. And, and maybe, you know, you'll just now hear about it or read about it or be thinking about it in different ways. And um, if you are, I hope you'll know that BioBuilder is, um, you know, here online. You can drop us a note and we'll figure out a way to, to get you uh, working in this community and, and thinking about this some more. So, um, so with that, maybe I will stop sharing my screen and um, offer to hand it back over to Corinne and Alexa. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a great introduction uh, to synthetic biology. And thank you to everyone who uh, asked questions as well. You guys had some great things. Um, so the next part of our uh, event today is the chance to create your own bio design. Now, this could be sort of in the input output framework uh, that was mentioned in the presentation or it could just be like a current um, uh, current research that's going on right now. Uh, but what will happen is that we will break everyone up randomly uh, into four different groups and each group will have a overarching topic. So we have food and energy, manufacturing, environment and health and medicine. Um, and we've prepared a inspiration slide uh, for each uh, topic. Uh, that lists current research as well as problems that need to be solved in that area. Um, so as a group, you will kind of talk about what parts stand out to you. Maybe it's pollution, maybe it's a certain disease like diabetes, um, and then think about how you could use synthetic biology uh, to solve that problem. Um, feel free to do as much Googling as you want. The idea really here is just to see how many different applications there are. Um, and not necessarily like coming up with your own design. If you do, that's great. We, I very much encourage that. Um, but yeah, there will be 15 minutes long. Uh, we will assign a spokesperson so that when we come back, each group will present the uh, their bio design idea. All right. Um, so now is the share and present your bio designs. Um, so we're gonna go in the order of food and energy, environment, health and medicine, and then manufacturing. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what you guys, what you guys came up with. Uh, the food and energy spokesperson, take it away. What'd you guys find? What'd you come up with? 
So if anyone from our group wants to talk, then let me know. But if not, I can go ahead and talk about what we were thinking of for the food and energy design. Um, we were kind of coming up with an idea similar to golden rice, but for vitamin C, where we would be creating yeast that would create vitamin C, which we could turn into a powder, maybe to put into drinks for people who lack easy access to vitamin C, especially in the winter or not in tropical areas. Um, so yeah, that was our idea. Does the environment group want to go ahead? That sounds really cool. Um, yeah, so we were the environment group and we chose to have a focus on water pollution for this case. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick it off by um, kind of describing like one of our focuses um, on water pollution, which can be um, harmful microbe in the form of bacteria, such as the legionnaire bacteria, which can cause legionnaire disease. So typically um, in the past, people have tried um, either increasing the water temperature or adding chlorine, um, which can cause the bacteria to um, be killed off. But bacteria also may instead choose to go inside amoeba and hide so they escape this treatment. So what we've um, thought about is that if we genetically engineer these amoeba to produce a toxin that's harmful to these legionnaire bacteria, then that toxin will be capable of killing both the bacteria in the water and in the amoebas as well. So it'll be a more um, efficient approach to um, the solution, um, even though there is the possibility of developing some um, toxicological resistance as well to those toxins, but yeah. I believe we also had some like other facets of that design if my group wants to speak about that as well. Okay. Um, next we have health and medicine. So Hi, so we did health and medicine and our kind of idea was to um, kind of engineer this kind of bacteria that would be uh, going to your, your body and would work with your white blood cells so that whenever they came in contact with a certain disease, it would stain that uh, white blood cell a certain color. So that way, whenever um, blood testing happens, you can look at the white blood cells and see the and measure the amount of um, white blood cells that have this immunity to that certain disease. So that whenever, you know, there's if there's a good amount of these stained white blood cells that have this immunity, then their person is good to go. But if they are lacking, they can say, okay, now is the time to get a vaccine to help that uh, have immunity in the future. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great job. Um, yeah, it looks like a really interesting project. Um, lastly, manufacturing. Um, but I can kind of say, uh, summarize some of the things, um, you know, ideas that the ladies had. Um, and I hope I did it as much justice as you were portraying, uh, Meredith. Um, but uh, one of the, the big focus of the discussion was, you know, we're in a time of, of you know, concerns for the environment, especially you know, at the time where a lot of us are, are you know, due to the pandemic, um, we're trying to think how we can re uh, reduce the use of plastics. Um, so an idea is for the, or also reuse um, items to make new things. And so the idea the ladies had was to use uh, microorganisms to break down plastics that they can then be used to make um, other products. Um, and then also to go along with that is the same microorganisms to also break down oil um, to help in for pollution. So they looked at those multiple things to kind of go into the environment um, aspects. Um, I don't know if any of the la other ladies in the, in the group uh, would like to also um, add any ideas that I might have missed. I think that's really cool. I know there's a lot of research labs out there that are doing that type of research. So I think that's definitely um, something that lots of people are looking into. So you guys are, had really good ideas. I think we talked a lot about too, like the, the ability to kind of bring environmental concerns into thinking about new, new products, right? And, and pro product kind of development and thinking about, I mean, the plastic was sort of a timely uh, place to start because we were just talking about, you know, COVID sort of implications and how that changed a lot of what we were doing. Um, and the fact that with, so much use of plastic just with delivery of items, right? And um, how, how could we sort of address that issue and then think about um, 
yeah, new utility. So it, uh, yeah, it was a great conversation. I think it was really an interesting topic. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I'm, I'm very impressed with what everyone came up with in, in just 10 minutes. So that's, wow, uh, awesome job. All right, now we're gonna move on to the bioethics discussion and I'll let Alexa take over. Okay, so we have a couple of questions for um, the bioethics kind of section of this event. Um, we don't have too much time left, so we have about 10 minutes to go over this stuff. So we have, um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, we have this question to talk about, and then we have a couple of examples um, afterward about current issues. So what could be some ethical concerns of our proposed synthetic biology technology? So I want you guys to think about the kinds of um, proposals that you just did um, and kind of come up with the pitfalls, like where could they possibly go wrong for execution? Um, like, what would you need to think about? What would you need to worry about to make sure that it has the intended impact without any possible negatives? So anyone can speak up or put it in the chat and I can read it out. Um, anything that you guys feel comfortable with doing is great. So Lauren said that the bacteria could develop resistance to toxin if given the opportunity to reproduce. So yeah, that's a really big thing in medicine right now. Um, bacteria are developing extreme resistance to the antibiotics that we have been using for decades. Um, and that's something that we haven't really come up with a solution for yet. So yeah, that's something that we definitely need to think about in the coming years. Um, does anyone else have any pitfalls specifically for their biotechnologies they were thinking of earlier? Or do any of the session leaders want to come up with um, some stuff about their own biodesigns that might answer this question? I could say something real quick. I know with the health and medicine one, I think a big uh, pitfall could be, can we actually put these organisms into the body? Like, would it be safe? Um, Cause you never know what effects some, something could have. Yeah, um, I think in our group, Alexa, where we were talking about the vitamin C and trying to do supplements, something you would have to balance is like, you'd have to come up with a way to actually figure out like how much vitamin, extra vitamin C that person needs. So there'd have to be some regulation around that type of product that it, people aren't just eating it to eat it. <laughs> um, so there could be some like health concerns with those types of things. Looks like Helen just wrote something in the chat. Yeah, so she said that living organisms change due to evolutionary principles, so they could do that in unpredictable ways and potentially harm people in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of goes with what we were talking about earlier, which is it's kind of hard to control the mutations of stuff once you have it out there. Um, and that's something that we would need to keep watch over if we're letting ourselves reproduce. Um, and then another one that was proposed is the ethical problems of bioengineering human cells. So I think we had an example about that later um, that we might not get to it, but we were talking about like the idea of engineering a child, like a human child before it's born to kind of decide um, its traits. Um, I think Caitlin had yeah, I think so. about that. I can just talk about this briefly for like a minute. So right now, one of the big hot topics in science is using uh, a technique called CRISPR to do gene editing. So CRISPR lets you uh, delete or edit really specific DNA sequences. So there is great opportunity to use CRISPR to address a lot of health problems um, that are particularly related to different genes. But there's also this question with CRISPR of using, using gene editing um, right now um, for designer babies. Um, so in China, I think in the last couple of years, they actually use CRISPR gene editing to try and uh, give this set of twin babies to have, to give them the ability to be resistant to HIV. Um, so this is one of the first examples of doing genetic editing of embryos. Um, 
for uh, babies. Um, but there's a lot of uh, backlash to this because um, there's no F, there's no guidelines right now for editing of uh, doing this type of editing in humans. And in particular, people are worried about using CRISPR to make something called like a designer baby, where you could maybe do something like here in this cartoon, where you could design your baby's like eye color, hair, and then they could do genetic editing to give you that type of baby. Um, but there's a lot of ethical concerns with this, um, mainly in terms of accessibility, what health problems this could introduce to the babies down the line, um, just because there are a lot of off-target effects when you do this type of gene editing. Um, so this is a big problem right now um, in the scientific community. Um, but yeah, that's just something, if you guys are more interested in this, there are lots of resources to learn about this. Yeah, um, we had another idea in the chat, which was about proper testing and labeling for consumers to get the most effective and proper results. Um, yeah, that's definitely something uh, you could think about it in terms of medicine, like you want consumers to be able to do precisely what they're being advertised to be able to do. Um, I know Corinne and I, for our synthetic biology uh, project outside of this event, we were doing um, something about having spider silk as a way to help with wound healing. Um, and that's something that we were thinking of maybe doing as like a consumer directed process where they would apply um, a ointment or something like that directly onto themselves. And it would be really important to make sure that they have really clear specific directions for how to do that without getting any potential negative outcomes. Um, yeah, so it looks like we only have two minutes left. So Caitlin, if you want to go to the other example slide that we had for a specific issue and we could talk about that for a bit. Yeah, so I think this one was me, um, but yeah, this was great. Thanks everyone for being involved in the ethical concern questions for the technologies. It was really, it's really interesting. So this is just another real world example, uh, lab grown meat. It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's meat grown in the lab. Um, so they take cells from animals, typically stem cells that can be differentiated into many other types of cells, and they actually grow them in cell culture conditions um, and mass produce these in bioreactors, and they ultimately get this pinkish paste uh, that then can be mixed with other ingredients to create a minced meat, or you can use tissue engineering methods with scaffolds to basically create uh, meat cuts and steaks. Um, so obviously there's a lot of potential benefits, you know, with these new, with the, this new technology, such as addressing global food crisis, um, you know, cost effectiveness of producing this meat. Also, there's been some research into how this can be more healthy for humans because we can put the nutrients we want into it. Um, but again, thinking about the ethical issues, you know, some people who, um, you know, there's this article here that I'm a vegetarian, but will they eat? this meat. And at the end of the day, it's still sourced from animals. You know, it is friendlier to animals, um, but it still uses animal cells. And there's actually some controversy around the cell culture media itself to grow these cells because it uses animal serum that still has to come from the animals. So, you know, as you can see, there's a, a huge balancing act with a lot of these technologies. Um, you know, also the motivational piece behind this, are we doing it for the humans? Or are we doing it for the animals? Because you know, at the end of the day, this is an economical choice, you know, it's healthier maybe, but, you know, or are we actually doing it to help the animals? So it's, you know, comes back to the balancing act of, of the ethical concerns. And these are definitely things to consider throughout all these technologies. Okay, so it looks like we're at time. Um, we have some final slides. Um, Corinne, if you want to go through this really quick. You mean the, the final questions or just like the, the uh, just last... like the ending slide. Okay. Um, do you want to move to, I think the slide 19. All right. So this concludes the virtual synthetic biology event. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you learned something new. Uh, I learned about synthetic biology all the way back freshman year, and I've just been so excited about it ever since. Um, so you should, if you want to, I hope you come to future events. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, YWeb Ambassadors, YWeb RTP. 
so yeah, thank you all for coming. Really excited and I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend.